All right, so we're in the book of Genesis. Not a hard one to find in the Bible. Chapter 3, not a hard number to find. And book of Genesis. Genesis means beginnings. And it, it is the book of beginnings. It is the beginning of the universe, the beginning of mankind, the beginning of marriage, the beginning of work and responsibility. But it's also the beginning of man's problems, the beginning of sin and temptation. So often when I do a funeral, I remind people, you know, death is not a thing that anybody really looks forward to. And Jesus understood it was an obstacle to man. It, it, it had a sting to it. But he took away that sting for those that would follow him because for us, ultimately, even though it's still hard and God created us to hang on to life or else we would just give up, right? And that's why we hang on to life so, so radically. God created that in us. But for us as believers, it is a doorway to a new body and entering into the presence of God. And um, so at funerals, I remind people that it's not God's fault man chose to sin. And we think, well, if I was Adam, I wouldn't have sinned, and I doubt it, you would have, right? And so often we have this pompous attitude, but we need to be careful because we still add to the sin ball, don't we? Even after we're redeemed, we keep on sinning. And now hypothetically and theologically, it is potentially possible theologically possible to not sin, but we still know that we will. And the Lord says, if you sin, you need to come to me and you need to confess, right? You need to keep that relationship close. So it's the beginning of man's sin, and it gives us the reason for every sickness, every murder, every rape, every war, every harsh word spoken, every death, every suffering, every tear was man's fault because man chose to rebel against perfection. Now, story of a woman married to a man that was a tightwad. She had to fight for everything that she got. One day she told him she was going window shopping, and he said, look, but don't buy. A few hours later, she came home with a new dress. What is this? The husband fumed. I thought I told you to look, but not buy. Well, she explained, I saw this lovely dress, and I thought I'd try it on. And when I did, the devil said, it sure looks good on you, babe. <laughs> right then, you should have told him, woman, get behind me, Satan. I did, she answered. And when he got behind me, he said it looked good from there also. <laughs> so I had to buy the dress. But that would be Satan's ploy, right, on a, on a woman. Yeah, you sure look good, babe. Right? Every woman wants to be beautiful. And that's what Satan, that's why Satan chose the woman first. Because she had incredible things that the man didn't have. And therefore she was susceptible to that particular temptation. The Niagara Falls drops 180 feet. Very, very violent crash. And you've probably seen pictures of it. And right above the falls, you can tell the falls are coming because the water starts to speed up, doesn't it? It starts to be pulled over the falls. With the, the way water works, it kind of pulls water behind it. If it starts to fall, it's pulling the water behind it faster. And so there's rapids right before. And you know you're in trouble if you're right before the falls. Now you're in bigger trouble of going over the falls. But a few hundred yards upstream, it's very calm. You can swim in it. You can boat in it. You can row in it because the water is not moving very fast, but you're still in danger. And so in that area, there's always a warning. If you're going to boat here, do you have an anchor? Followed by the sign, right underneath it on the sign says, and do you know how to use it? And so here's the thing. Your life might be calm now, and you're not in the rapids, meaning you're probably not on guard. Doesn't mean you don't need to make sure that your anchor is ready to go. Because we know how quickly things can turn in our lives. And we need that anchor, and we know how to, need to know how to use it. So if you're in a place of smooth sailing right now, stay close to Jesus. 
If you're in a place of turbulence, obviously you're grabbing hold of Jesus. And if you're going over the falls, you're white-knuckling Jesus, right? But they're living in paradise. They don't think anything can happen, right? Because they don't even know what evil is. So Adam and Eve are living in this garden of perfection. So it says in chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, as a Bible teacher, the first thing that strikes me is, are we in the Chronicles of Narnia or what? Because you have this animal starting a conversation with humans. How in the world could this happen? Oh, this has to be fiction. This has to be fantasy. This has to be foolishness. Well, number one, we know that this animal is not a human created in God's image, but it is talking, and therefore this animal has an intelligent spirit within it. This animal is possessed by Satan at this moment. And this animal is being used by Satan. And so how, why in the world would this woman start talking to this um, serpent? Well, the fact is, nothing evil had ever happened. She wasn't afraid of being bitten. Everything was brand new, and everything was good. And so she was off guard, as it were. Talking to an animal? No problem there, because I don't know any better. And I don't know, your children, you probably watch your children do this. I used to love going with my children shopping when they were little, and I'd give them church invites and tracks. I used to make a lot of tracks when, when we were uh, a younger church and, and everything, and I'd, I'd give my kids just a handful of tracks, and you'd have these two little blonde-haired, chubby-faced little girls in the shopping cart going, here, mister, here, mister, and they don't care what they look like. Full tatted down, head to tie, biker, you know, biker jacket on, and, and, you know, stinky like they haven't taken a bath in a week. But here, mister, it didn't matter because there's that innocence, Right? And you need to understand, there's pure innocence in the garden. Now, we wouldn't have to question allowing our kids to ride a bike a mile or more to school if we understood more innocent times in our country. I grew up with, with uh, five siblings in a house that was 1,000 square feet in a, in, in a lower-class neighborhood. And I walked as a kindergartner to school about a mile every day. And, and in those days, kindergarten was half a day. So I would literally wake up with all my biker buddies, we'd get on our little bikes, and we'd ride all around town, miles away, and just have adventures that my mom, you know, it wasn't the danger of people we were so worried about, although there were evil people around, but just nowhere near as much as today. You know, but, but we'd go to construction sites and be climbing up in these buildings. I remember swinging out on a cable on an overpass, 57 freeway. <laughs> Me and my five-year-old buddies, you know. <laughs> it's like innocent times, though, right? And these are the most of innocent times. Now, why did Satan choose the serpent? Well, God had designed the serpent in a very unique way. He was very cunning. Right? I mean, uh, snakes, you don't hear them coming. Normally, snakes surprise us because we walk upon them, right? And, 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 and all, but we, we don't know specifically why. But we do know that the serpent in every culture, um, in, in much of that culture, not, not throughout the culture, because sometimes people worship snakes, but, but the snakes are significant. They're either a source of fear or a source of worship. Isn't that interesting? And so the serpent really has had some strong emotional ties to humanity ever since this day. Now, here we're going to see how most temptations work as we look at the serpent. Because he said to the woman, has God indeed said? Has God indeed said? What's happening? Well, Satan is questioning God's word. Satan is questioning God's word. You know, we have so many denominations that started off so well nowadays that are just like the world today. You know why? They let go of the Bible and they held on to the world. 
And guys, that didn't start recently. It took a while for them to get there. It started in the late 1800s. Higher biblical criticism, it's called. And so you got a bunch of professors sitting around in air-conditioned rooms, smoking cigars with their PhDs piled high and deep. I don't have a PhD. I have a THD, by the way. (laughs) But they sit around in their comfort in their air conditioning with their tenure and, and, and their, their salary, and they decide Jesus didn't really say what he said. And the disciples, they didn't really know what they were talking about. But they were willing to die for what they knew was true. But these men have nothing to lose. And so they just make stuff up. And they want to be famous for how outlandish they can be. And since they have tenure, they can't be fired. And so they just start teaching the next generation of theologians their piled high and deep theories, which are just lies. And there comes a point when your brain is just not sufficient. It isn't, just, it isn't sufficient because God's ways are high. They're beyond us. And, and, and they're past finding out. And he says that to us so many times in the scriptures. When Job was questioning God, God didn't even give him the answer. I don't know if Job could have handled the answer. Job got more of God. And I shared with you guys on Sunday, I've had to let go of the whys in my situation with my wife and just trust God. I've had to put my brain on the shelf because I know God is right. And if I question him and determine him to be wrong, I'm wrong already. Because he's high. His ways are high above my ways. Isaiah chapter 55, I think it's verse 8 past finding out. But what does he do? He questions God's word. Now, God's word properly understood is God's word properly understood. If it's God, Linda, you are forgiven. (laughs) If it's not, see me after class. No, just kidding. (laughs) Don't mess with Linda. She'll take you out at the knees, man. (laughs) Anyways. Questioning God's word. And I tell you what, some things in the Word of God are confusing, and sometimes we can interpret them wrong, and sometimes we take them as a general truth, even though it's more of a specific truth, and we've all fallen into that trap. But understand, ultimately, God's Word is true. And so he's questioning her, and they only have a little bit of Scripture. Adam, here's your wife. Be married. You know, take care of the stuff. Name the animals. Don't eat of this one tree. There's not a whole lot of scripture. They had all the scripture memorized at that point in time, right? God's word was a few sentences. And he's our Satan's already questioning God's word because he hates God. And so the question is, it's a loaded question because has he really said? Isn't he just manipulating you? He's not really good. You're a plaything. You're just a tool. I got something more. I I can make you bigger than God wants to ever let you be. You can be something else than he's called you to be. He's not fair. He's restricting you. He's holding you back. You ever tell your parents that they're like ruining your life when you were young? And they're just trying to save your life and you're telling them they're ruined, they're limiting you? But who had the real knowledge? Your parents. When you have ideas or people suggesting to you that there is something wrong or unfair with God's word, be careful. Not everybody agrees with me theologically, and that's fine. But as long as they have a good biblical reason, I can respect that they're trying to to be right, and so am I. But when they just get their ideas out of the air from other people, and they have no root or basis in the scripture, I just don't respect that. This is one of the early lessons, guys. God's word is true. Let everyone else be a liar. You know, historians argue about two or three kingdoms and the timing of the kingdoms. You know, they retimed the kingdoms of Egypt to make sure that it didn't line up with the Bible in order to disprove the Bible as opposed to actually looking at the evidence. And evidence lines up perfectly. And there's tons of evidence that the Jews were enslaved in Egypt. And at a certain time, at the right time, under a certain pharaoh, 
they left. There was an exodus. But the world works double time making up lies. And you know what? Let history be a liar because the Bible is going to be true. A lot of argument over old earth, young earth. God was there. He viewed it. He says six days. Whatever that means to God, it's going to be six days in heaven. I don't know how fast time was expanding. I don't know about the astrophysics and the physics and the quantum physics and everything else that was happening. Could you imagine nothing and then everything? What about the speed of light? When did that even, even come into being? Or was the earth spread out or the universe spread out quicker than the speed of light? Was there nothing and then there was something the size of the universe and he created everything? Even the lines between the stars, the, the, the lines of the protons between the stars out of this big water and just said, Whoosh! and then created everything within that? Huh? Seems to say what the Bible says. You know, and, and so the Bible's going to be right, regardless of man's argument. So watch out for that one. That's a big one. Is God right or not? Is he just trying to rain on your parade? Or is what he says good for you? Does God want you to be miserable? Or does God want the best for you? Now, personal observations here. It says, i got to turn this on first. There you go. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So what we're seeing here is Satan attacking the woman first, right? Eve, has God really said? Now, Adam got the command, and he was supposed to teach it to his wife. And he was her leader, and therefore he was responsible for her actions. Because Eve was picked upon because of her makeup, not the makeup she was wearing. I don't think she had to. No blemishes on this lady. Right? And her desire to be spiritual. So she's everything that the man is not in order to make up the nurturing, the beauty, the care, the sensitivity, the depth of God, and man representing the strength and the duty and the honor and the courage of God, right? And so he picks on her because she has this desire for relationship way above what man does. And that's normally true, and pretty much across the board, women are normally better at developing relationships around conversation and actually getting to know each other. Men are better at getting to know each other by doing things together. Women talk, and they sit knee to knee and talk to each other, deep things from the heart. <laughs> And men go fishing or disc golfing or surfing or whatever. You know, they do things side by side doing stuff, right? But that's why Satan picked on her. Because he's saying, you can, you can be deeper with God. You can know more. You can be more intimate. So he picked on a good thing. And understand, when you're really good at something, it can also be one of your greater weaknesses. Now, I talk a lot. God give me a mouth to speak the gospel. If I don't, woe to me. Problem is, I need to watch my mouth because a lot of words come out of this mouth and I can hurt people with my mouth just as quickly as I can bless people with my mouth. So my blessing is my cursing. At the same time, I got to watch out. That gift can turn really quickly. So the blessing of Eve also left her susceptible. Okay? And also note that often cults will knock on the door when is it expected that the wife will be home and not the husband. Young man shows up my, at my house about 10 o'clock on a weekday. And I look at him like, why are you here at 10 o'clock on a weekday? Seems to me that you were sent out here, whether you know it or not. But there's a plan for you to talk to my wife. And she's thinking, oh, poor little 19-year-old boy away from his family for two years. Oh, isn't that cute? You call yourself elder. And you're, you're 19 years old. What a sweet young man. And then starts playing on that emotional desire to see this young man, or he's away from home, and maybe she has a son and off of college. And there's, there's all these things that Satan loves to play on. And many cults have been started by women because of that very desire to, 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 to be in more relationship with God. And so that manipulation can happen. But another observation is this. Adam didn't step in on the conversation. Was he fishing? I don't think so. 
he was likely sitting right next to her. But it does not say, he did not step in, but he was the one to lead her. He was the one that had the commandment. He knew what to do. He had the right to shoo the serpent away because he had dominion over, at that point, dominion over the earth. Satan didn't have dominion. He could have said, get out of here because you're doubting what God just told me a few days ago. And that's not true. Shoo. He had that right. He was also, I mean, basically, who is sin uh, blamed upon in the scriptures? Adam. Because Eve was deceived. She was manipulated by Satan. But Adam made a choice to sin. Verse 2, and the woman said to the serpent, may we eat, or we may eat of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it. This is true. Nor shall you touch it, lest you die. That is not true. They could have touched it all they want, but they just weren't supposed to eat it. So already the words of God are being twisted and misunderstood, and that happens so often. Listen, even though I study the Word of God, I always got to go back to the Word of God. And I got I to rethink through it and just go, where am I at right now? Like, like have, I, have I lost my way? And I ask myself that all the time. Just today, yesterday and today, I've been listening to this man that's like, he was an, he's an engineer, a mechanical engineer, and he's, he's doing a lot of apologetics in the scriptures. And I love that because he's thinking not like a theologian. He's thinking like an engineer. And if you're you know, trying to shoot a rocket into space to hit the moon, you better be 100%. Two plus two ain't five at that point in time, guys. You need to be exact. And he's looking at the word, and I go, praise God, and just reminded me how careful we need to be with the word of God. And he was talking about prophecy, how exact God is with prophecy and how much we as theologians can mess with it. It's our temptation to make our, our theology rock solid and no one can argue against us because we're right. And we can really get messed up because of our pride. And so it's so good just to look at it again and again and say, God, am I on the right track? And so what does she do? She was told by Adam, God said, don't eat of that fruit. Whatever you do, don't eat of that fruit. So again, but of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And we talked about that, spiritual death and sep separation from God through sin, and spirit, which is spiritual death, spiritual separation. So then the question is, why in the world would God ever allow that tree to exist? Why did he put that tree in the midst of the garden? And it's really simple. Why give man the ability to sin? It's about love, and love always demands a choice. Love demands a choice. Without a choice, it's not love. Arranged marriage doesn't start off with love. Many times it's a business arrangement or a power brokerage, but it's not love. Now, they can grow to love one another and start making choices to love one another, but it certainly doesn't start there. Because love demands a choice. Without a choice, it's not love. It's just not. And the greatest commandment of God is to love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. We know the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the whole of the law. If you follow these, you're following God's law perfectly. Love. And you have a choice to do so or not. And so God had to allow the man to have a choice in that garden. And love shows up in obedience. You don't obey to love you love, and therefore you obey. Don't get it backwards. Many people do. But you obey because you love. If you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said. So how can we love God if we don't have a choice not to love him? If they were just robots programmed just to do good and worship God, you know, you might as well get a little robot toy and just 
tell you, I love you, you're my friend. It might make you feel good if you want to be a knucklehead, but it's not real love. And listen, the love of your pets, that's nice. Your pets love you. They recognize you. They come up to the door. They can't wait to see you. But is that the same type of love that a human has for a human? No. We have more of a choice. And so love is a choice. And that's why God had to allow the choice. Verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will surely not die. Now that's direct contradiction to the word of God, right? For God knows in that day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Here's the thing. God knows what evil is, but he hasn't experientially tasted it. He felt the results of evil on the cross, 100%. But God hasn't experientially experienced evil. He knows what it is. So Satan is only partially right. He's saying, you will be like God, being good and knowing what evil is. No, that's not what he says. Absolutely knowing good and evil. So what he's saying is, you shall be like God. In all reality, you'll be like me. Because Satan started off really good, didn't he? He was likely... One of the angels around the throne, closest to God, worshiping God in song. And it seems that he was a worship leader in heaven. Watch out, worship leaders. <laughs> and he fell hard. So in all reality, he's wanting them to be like him. Fallen, broken, experiencing evil. So he attacked God's word by denying the truth, doubting it, and then disregarding it. And he got Eve to doubt the consequences of her rebellion against God. And Satan loves us to get sin, see sin as good and not as evil. God said, do not do this. And he's going, no. God's holding you back from something that's so good. And as a teenage boy with hormones pulsing through my body, Oh, God, you don't want me to have sex until marriage? Oh, that's not good. And then I remember just all the entanglements of my pursuit of having sex brought me and the heartbreak and the hurt and the emotional attachments that would be broken continually and just have my heart ripped into shreds. And then eventually when I lost my virginity to a girl that I dated a long time, I kind of I kinda go, is that it? And I'm supposed to worship this, and this is supposed to be my whole drive in life, and it doesn't look like it looks like on the movies. It was a lie. So Satan loves to get us to see sin as good and not evil. And we buy into these lies, and we find out when it's too late that we've been deceived. Anybody ever experienced the deception of sin? But since many don't see the consequences of sin coming quickly, for God is very gracious, we negate the consequences of our actions, and that's very dangerous because now we're, we, we get so sucked into our sin, and then God eventually judges us, and we start to see the results of our sin. Because the consequences aren't so quick, are they? Many times they come back years later. So again, God does not know experientially evil, but Satan does. And so he wants the woman to be like him, become like God, or become like a God. And understand, this goal of becoming God is the center of so many non-Christian religions and beliefs, and even political systems. Socialism and communism don't want God involved. Well, they'll use your belief in God against you, but they don't want to believe in God because they believe they want to become God. If they can get rid of God, who's the top of the heap? Humans. The national religion of America is official. It's humanism. Man is God. New age. You're God. Don't you realize that you're God? And that's everywhere, and it's not a new lie. It's an old lie. It just puts on new clothes all the time. Mormonism, P 
People want to and believe that they can become God. Now, why do we want to become God? Because we have sin natures, and we want to be able to become God so we can force our will on others. What's a true and living God like? He's God, and he came to save others as a serpent at a significant cost to himself. That's the true God. But we want to become God so we can force things on other people. It is so opposite of God. And see how screwed up we get? You know, I want to be the head of the company so I can boss people around. Or I want to be the head of the company so I can help people reach their full potential and bless others and help them take care of their families because I think I could be good at it for God's glory. There's a difference, isn't there? And one seems to try to feed the flesh even though it's destroying the soul. And the other, which is God's plan, enriches... Uh, uh, Enriches the flesh, but you have to, or enriches the soul, but you have to die to the flesh. But it's still much more satisfying. So everything here is backwards. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lie, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and that it was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave her husband with her, and he Eight. He made a choice to sin. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And immediately that happened. They turned away from God and they chose the world rather than God. Pleasant, good, desirable. Avenues of deception. The fleshly perspective opposed to the spiritual perspective. What happens? You get trapped by these things, and they bring destruction, and they bring division in your life. And you become more like the devil than like the Lord. And all of a sudden, kerplunk. Sin enters the world. Sin enters the universe. And the universe is now struck. And I don't know how it happened. But I could imagine some incredible movie producer using special effects and just looking at this little speck of dust on the edge of the, of the universe, on the edge of a galaxy, amongst 15 billion stars in that galaxy and billions and billions of galaxies out there, and just right then, think a ripple effect throughout the universe, and entropy starts. The beginning of the end. It now takes place. The crack has happened. It was all good. All of a sudden, it is no longer good. Why? Because the crowning creation has now turned against God. The one that God gave dominion has now fallen. And, and that's radical. And guys, that doesn't happen when an ape all of a sudden realizes he's a human being and then all of a sudden thinks he has a conscience and whatever. You know, trying to get Christianity and Darwinian evolution together just doesn't work. You either sacrifice Christianity or you sacrifice your belief in Darwinian evolution. <laughs> so sin enters the world, and Adam is responsible for that. Paul says this, Therefore, as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin. And thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Who's it blamed on here? Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, For as in... Adam, all die, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. Now, this is a big deal. It's called the federal headship of Christ and the, hetero, the federal headship of Adam. And God was so wise in the way that he did this because before Adam and Eve ever sinned, or excuse me, before they ever had children, they sinned. And therefore, sin entered into, the brokenness of Adam entered into all men, and eventually all men start willfully sinning. But because it came in through one man, the federal headship of God tells us that through one man, it can now be taken out as well. And in God's incredible plan, he had this plan before man was ever put on the earth. This is God's eternal plan before time began. I talked about it on Sunday, that God would send Jesus to live a perfect life, that in him we might all be able to be saved. And that is a, a deep theology that's not taught very often. But the he federal headship of Adam and the uh, he uh, federal headship of Jesus Christ. 
So why did Adam do it? Well, maybe didn't, Adam didn't want Eve to be alone in that condition. The spiritual head of the family, he should have protected her. We don't know, but I just imagine he saw and he did eat. He made a choice. There was no manipulation here. He knew that he was going against the Lord. Eve was deceived, but Adam chose to hand it over at that point. Okay, we all have the potential to sin, don't we? How do we have victory over sin? God's word. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Again, in my life right now, I'm, a, I'm an Isaiah, Isaiah 55 guy because I, I'm a thinker and I love to think through my theology and other people's theology and listen to apologetics all the time. And that's just, I don't know, like a good day of listening to podcasts of smart people is like heaven. <laughs> you know, like, and many of you are going, oh my gosh, you're a sick person. Yes, probably, but I still love it. And my brain just eats it up. You know, and I wish I could just relax and just read the word of God and just go, oh, it's so good. Yes. Let me just chew on that. Jesus loves me, this I know. But that's not me. So I've had to take my brain right now with the situation that I'm in and just go neutral because I know you're right, God. And everything I've read and everything I know intellectually, I know you're right. And right now you don't make sense to me. So I just have to believe that you're right. And you're going to show me. And I sure hope it's this side of heaven. And I sure stink and hope it's soon. Please pray. But it's hard right now. But every day, I have to say to God, I don't know what you're doing, but I know you're doing something. And I've got to trust you. And, and if we get through this, this side of heaven, it's big. If not, you know, rapture soon. <laughs> you know, if not that, you know, just... Lord, give me strength to make it through and learn everything I can, right? So God's word is what I'm holding on to right now. And you might have a different verse that you're holding on to, but you hide it in your heart that you may not sin against him because it's right. And you need to understand when it runs smack dab into your wrong thoughts, it's right and you're wrong. And you've got to know that. And you've got to be able to trust that. And the beauty of it is the Lord doesn't, he rarely leaves you hanging and eventually you, under, you, you learn why. Not always. There's no promise in that. Job never understood why. He just got more of God. Right? But normally we see the lesson somewhere along the line, don't we? He still loves us. He's already died for me. Greater love has no man than this. Then a man lay down his life for his friend. He's already died for me. He's already died for me in my sinful state. Certainly he loves me when I'm trying to walk with him and I'm struggling. He's already died for me. No greater love. He can't love me any more than he already does. That's what the word of God says. So even though I don't feel this ushy, cushy, gooey love, I know he loves me. Why? The word of God says so. The word of God is true. How do you fight sin? Do I do it perfectly? Absolutely not. Does it come right when that person cuts in front of me in line? Nope. It doesn't always come right away. But I want to hide his word in my heart, number one. Stand by the word of God. Number two, prayer. And Jesus seemed to feel that prayer was an essential element in handling temptation. He said in the garden, the night he was betrayed, watch and pray, at least you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing and the flesh is weak. So what did they do? They took a nap. That was a problem. One of those guys taking a nap, his name was Peter. Peter wakes up, he's groggy, all these men are there with torches, and what does he do? He takes a swipe as a fisherman with a sword. He probably would have been better with a net in his hand, but he had a sword, and he cuts off a guy's ear, and the Lord rebukes him. He didn't have a good night that night, Peter, but he didn't watch and pray either, did he? He slept. And even in the Sermon on the Mount, he gives us a outline of the elements of prayer and in that outline of the elements of prayer matthew chapter 13 it says do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one and that's important because we are susceptible to satan's greatest ploy which is our thought life 
I don't believe he can possess me, but he can sure harass me by putting thoughts into my head. And the Bible says, keep, it, keep every thought captive and battle against those strongholds and tear them down. And strongholds can be understood to be thoughts and ideas and trends and the movement of society. Tear down those ideas with the truth of God and don't let them certainly in your mind. Get behind me, Satan. So Eve could have called out to God for help. God, I don't know. I'm confused. What's going on here? And she didn't. She tried to handle it without him. Guys, you might think you're, you're hot stuff. You're not. Satan is more powerful than we are now. Now, someday we'll be able to judge him, and we'll look at him in our revised state and go, poof, yeah, whatever. But now, mm-mm. John said, I'm not going to, I think it was John, I'm not going to bring an ag- accusation. Maybe it was Paul, I can't remember. Um, against Satan. I don't dare do that. He's a powerful being. So you pray. You go to the bigger guy. He's got your back. And number three is basically your your location. Don't hang around tempting places (laughs) or tempting people. If you have a problem with women, don't hang around at strip joints. I'm just drinking a Diet Coke. No. Not a good idea. Proverbs 7, Solomon tells the story of a young man who wasn't wise. A young man found himself wandering the streets one night and just happened to go down the street where an adulterous woman lived. The young man, gra- or the woman grabs the man and whispers in his ear, and the young man ends up committing adultery. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately, he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till an arrow struck his liver. As a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it. It would cost his life. You know, it's funny, growing up, it's, you know, obviously I talk about surfing a lot, and I've surfed a lot in my life, and people don't understand this with me, you know, because the beach can be a big temptation to people. And as a young man, certainly looking at the girls could be a huge temptation, right? You guys need to understand some of Years ago, I, I learned to hate the beach. I hate the beach. It's all sandy and hot. Gross. The sand sticks to you and your sweat. You get sunburnt. If you ever go to the beach with me, you're going to find I'm always out in the water. Because I knew being on the beach was a snare to me. So I'd drive to the beach, go surfing, and come home. I didn't hang out on the beach. If I was going to go surfing twice, I'd go surf, eat, come back, go surfing again. You know, I just, I just tried to be wise in that area. You know, the the channels on my TV, my family shares them with me. And so my brother, my uh, my cousin, you know, we we all buy a subscription to whatever and we share, but we can watch each other, whatever we're watching on the TV. We're just trying to be wise, right? But set up roadblocks. It's okay. It's good. I still have something on my iPad where, and and my phone, where if I I go to a certain thing, it'll just go, bloop. It It won't take me to the site. I like that, that filter. You know, every so often I got to ask myself, and this is a good thing, is it still on there? Does it still work? You know, and it's still on there and it works. I, I, you know, don't go there. Don't just tempt yourself. Oh, you know, for work I have to do this. Well, there's ways, right? So just don't go down that street. So he went after as an ox goes to the slaughter, as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till an arrow struck his liver, as a bird hastens to the snare. He did, know it. he did not know it, and it cost his life. There's a Danish proverb that says, no one can be caught in a place that he does not visit. Boy, them Danish are smart. <laughs> can a man take fire into his bo- bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one, one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? That's, that's not a hard question to answer. Now, if you're thinking, huh, let me see, you know. If you hang around pl- places filled with temptation, you only make it more difficult for yourself. Now, literally, I think I could go hang out in a bar. I have no desire to get drunk. Some of you couldn't do that. 
I wouldn't want to hang out in a bar. Drunk people aren't the funnest people to try to minister to because they're normally not listening and they don't remember what you had to say anyways, right? But it's like, eh, you know, I could go in and order a Diet Coke and literally do that. I wouldn't do that. I might cause someone to stumble. And what if I walked in there to get a Diet Coke and I saw you in there? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so some things are my problem, some things aren't. But you've got to know what your problems are and stay away from those areas. Location, and then finally, flee. Flee. No temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, he will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And so sometimes you find yourself in a situation where you're feeling tempted. Being tempted isn't sin. The sin is taking the next step into that temptation to where maybe you get past the point where God has allowed you to escape. But you have chosen to go past that place. And these are willful things that we're talking about. But he gives you an exit. When Joseph was working for Potiphar in Egypt, most likely, the the hard thing is Potiphar most likely was, was castrated as a servant of the king, but he still had a wife. So this lady wanted affection. And here's this young man that wasn't castrated serving in her home. And she wants him. And she hits on him. What does he do? He runs off. And he even leaves his his outer garment. He runs off in his underwear naked in order not to sin. So here we are. They've sinned. Genesis 3, 7 says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Here's the first man-made religion. We're going to cover up our shame. The first church of the fig leaves. That's what they're doing. So they tried to cover their sin. They tried to atone, which means cover for their sin, with fig leaves. They'd never really noticed themselves. They were so into God and each other that they didn't even notice that they themselves were even naked and there was no shame to be ashamed of. And all of a sudden, it all changed. It all came crashing down. And now they're looking at themselves. And they heard the sound, verse 8, of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord and among the trees of the garden. Now, this one verse is worth about three sermons, but I'm not going to do that. But what is one of the great effects that sin has on us? We want to hide from God. You're struggling as a Christian, and then you blow it. Instead of coming to your brothers and sisters in the Lord, or instead of going back to church and persevering and pushing through that struggle that you have, what do you do? You start to hide. And you start to pull away. It ruins your relationship with God, and it ruins your relationship with Christian brothers and sisters. What does it do? Sin always causes separation. And that's immediately what happened. Instead of walking with God in the cool of the day, which would be so cool, they now are hiding from God. What a bummer. But it's the same thing that we do today. We believe that distance with sin is better than repentance with intimacy. But the fact of the matter is, that's a lie. Repentance with intimacy is always better than distance with sin, because, because God already knows about your sin. In fact, God already knows every sin that you'll ever do, but he still loves you. But we still try to hide. Don't do it. Just come back to God. You're going through a hard time. You're swimming upstream, but you seem to be going backwards. You know what? Still stick with God. Struggle, push, endure through it. He's going to love you all the way through it. So hiding is a part of the problem. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, what did he do? He tried to cover his sin, which led to more sin, which led to abject depression. When I kept silent, my bones grew old. Through my groaning all the long day, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer, Selah. But I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgive the iniquity of my sin, Selah. So he was still trying to cover over his sin, right? And he was busted. And then he confessed, and the Lord still took him back. It's better just to confess first, but he got busted and then confessed, and the Lord still said, that's better than hiding. But we make up all these excuses, and we still keep on trying to hide. So 
So acknowledging your sin is part of the solution. He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Now, I don't know if you've noticed in our church, that's one of our goals is to be an honest church, is to be real. So, so we can hide less when we show up and we can actually deal with our sin. You know, I've had people rebuke me because I'll talk about my attitude when someone cuts me off on the freeway. Or someone with 20, no, someone with 16 items gets in the 15 item line at the grocery store. <laughs> but I've literally had people rebuke me. Don't confess that you've had a problem or, no, 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 you're supposed to be the example of overcoming. I'm like, no, I'll just try to be real. Because if you're real and you see me driving out there, you're not going to stumble because you know I'm not a good driver. <laughs> you know, it's like, but I'm not, I'm not God. And I, I want to be a good example of what it means to really try to walk with God in honesty. You know, the best thing about my parents, and I really believe the reason I'm walking with the Lord today is because my parents lived with integrity. Doesn't mean they were perfect, they were real. They were real Christians which means when they sinned, they repented. When they sinned against us as kids, they said sorry. And they were humble people walking before God. That's the way you do it. You just live your life real. Don't hide. He loves you. And, and, and the neat thing is when people see that you recover and you're, you're a human walking with God, that's amazing. I could do that. If you can do that, I can do that. Maybe I'll become a Christian too. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then the Lord God called Adam and said to him, where are you? This does not mean that God did not know where Adam was. I really believe that God wanted Adam to think about where he was. What's happened, Adam? You notice something different here. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? So he tries to explain. Instead of fessing up, he continues to try to cover up. Don't, don't try to cover up. Fess up, guys. That'll be in my book of quotes. <laughs> don't cover up. Fess up. <laughs> and then he said, then the man said, the woman who you gave me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. This is a blame game. It's not my fault, it's that woman. It's not my fault, it's the woman that you gave me, Lord. It's the woman's fault and your fault, not my fault. And ultimately, the blame is on the one blaming. Eve was a victim of Adam's bad leadership at that point. He unjustly accuses Eve, and then he refuses to accept responsibility for his part in the sin. So again, he was either absent or inattentive to his wife, which is often what we men do. Inattentiveness is one of our biggest problems if, if you're married and you're male. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I did eat. I did eat. So... She's honest. I got deceived. I got manipulated. I was lied to. So Paul Harvey, the storyteller, passed away many years ago now, but we used to always have the, the, the Paul Harvey minute on the radio. I don't know if you guys remember that. And he'd always tell a folky story. It was like modern-day proverbs or fables or whatever. And he says this, there was a lady who was overweight and she blamed it on the traffic on the city street. You see, she would go to bed at night and the traffic outside her window would keep her awake. So rather than lie there awake, she'd get up and eat. Her reason for being overweight wasn't her overeating or a physical problem that she had, but rather it was the traffic. And we think that's kind of a little weird or odd, or what, but we do that, don't we? We'll find any way to say, uh uh, uh uh, uh uh, not me, not me. And I would dare say, man, I, I, I really started to grow once the Lord said to me, Yeah, you know, Rod, you're, you're, 
You're supposed to be the leader in that church. You're supposed to be the pastor. And you're supposed to be more mature than most of the people. I don't think I'm more mature than all the people in our church, but you're supposed to be a leader. And so you're leading people that are less mature than you. And so in in all reality, if someone causes you to react in a bad way, don't react on them. Come to me first and react well on them. Because I'm calling you a leader. I'm calling you to maturity. And if you don't respond well or you don't respond the way that I would want you to respond to that person, um, you're not really reflecting me and you're going to blame that person for your sin. So here's the thing. People do all kinds of crazy things that get me frustrated and can make me sin. But what I try to do at first is, why is it causing this reaction in me? And how can I respond well? And then the Lord kind of brings it around. How can you help this person do better? But it takes a while. But it takes really conscious practice. Because, guys, in the beginning, the reaction to the first sin, which is in every one of our DNA, is not me, it was them. But you're not going to learn that way if every time you react wrong, you blame it on everybody else. I'm Italian. I got passion. I get angry. So you're blaming it on all Italians. It's not your fault. (laughs) But you got to practice doing it right. Men are, are in the fall, we'll see. But part of our fall was frustration. You're going to work really hard and you're going to get weeds. Our greatest emotion, men, is frustration, isn't it? And many times it comes out in anger. But you have a superpower. And that superpower is to do what right, do what is right, even though you don't feel like doing it. So respond well, even though you're angry. Respond godly, even though your flesh is screaming out, just get it out there. You know what that's called? Duty. Doing what is right when you don't want to. And men have that ability. And then the other part is courage, doing what is right, even though you're afraid to do what is right. But duty is one of those things we as men can do. So you're Italian, so what? Be a man, right? Or whatever nationality you want to blame it on. In my heritage, the only reason I'm English is because my ancestors went and chopped off everybody's head from from Norway. They chopped off everybody's head in England, and they took over. So I'm English, but I'm actually Norse. And the Vikings just thrashed evilly in their just fleshly lust for blood and power and just evil. And that's in me. That's in my heritage. I don't bring out an axe. I bring out a sword called the Word of God. How am I supposed to respond? And I can choose to respond God's way, but it takes a lot of practice. And it takes responsibility. And you got to say sorry a lot to God when you do it wrong and say, help me to do it right next time. And women, same thing. You have this incredible ability to bring incredible things to this world. But what do we say? Oh, I'm a woman. I'm strong. Hit me with your best shot. You know, fire away. Whatever, you know, Pat Benatar attitude. From what I can tell, she's not a Christian. (laughs) It's been said that 99% of failures come from people who have the habit of making excuses. He who's good at making excuses is seldom good at anything else. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you uh, for your word. And even as we we haven't come to the conclusion of this chapter, Lord, but there's a lot there to chew on. Lord, we have inherited Adam. And you have redeemed us. And spiritually, Lord, we have this battle, the, the flesh of Adam and the spirit of Jesus, Lord. And help us to surrender more with more knowledge, with more wisdom, with more will to to walk your way. Lord, we know our salvation doesn't depend upon that. You died for every sin we would ever commit. But Lord, our effectiveness sure does. And so Lord, we want to be what you want us to be in this world, especially in a time like this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and close with a song.